This week's episode is brought to you by Groenfell Meadery, an open source meadery. Head over to groenfell.com to try the recipes at home or order mead right to your door at groenfell.com slash store. I was recently able to get my hands on some mead from Groenfell, and it is as delicious as I remembered. In fact, we had a socially distanced dinner at some friends the other night, and I brought some of the uh, Hop Swarm, which is a dry hopped mead, and it went very well with homemade apple pie. Ricky the Mead Maker says be on the lookout for Wild Hunt, a spiced cranberry and blood orange mead. He says it's out of this world. That's at groenfell.com slash store. That's G-R-O. E-N-N-F-E-L-L. Welcome to Basic Brewing Radio for Thursday, September 3rd, 2020. I'm James Spencer. Here at Basic Brewing Radio, we're all about home brewing. This week, beekeeper Caleb Hutcherson talks about his work in capturing bees from wild swarms and people's houses. Caleb then puts them to work making delicious honey that we can, in fact used to uh, make tasty meads. Uh, if you go to basicbrewing.com, you can find archives of our audio and video shows. And if you go to basicbrewingshop.com, you can find our DVDs, our brewer's logbooks, and other basic brewing gear. You can follow me on Twitter and Instagram, at Basic Brewing, and find our show page on Facebook as well. We have a cool Basic Brewing app on iTunes and Amazon.com, and we're found all over the place where fine podcasts are served up. If you want to support us financially, check out patreon.com slash basicbrewing, and thanks to everybody who's helping out in that way. If you go to patreon.com slash basicbrewing, you can see a long list of stuff that you can access if you sign up as a supporter. Last week, I talked to a fermentation expert, Sandor Katz, on the show, and he gave us tips on fermenting vegetables. That was a really good show. Uh, well, I forgot to talk about my own experience lately with uh, making fermented hot sauce. I did post some pictures on social media. My uh, first successful batch was made using peppers that I bought from our guest today, in fact, uh, Caleb, uh, down at the uh, far farmer's market here in town. I got habaneros, jalapenos, uh, banana peppers, and cow horns, and cut them all up into uh, two-quart-sized jars, uh, and I added a little garlic and green onion in there, too. Then I mixed up a brine of around 5% salt. Uh, I used uh, three tablespoons of sea salt in a quart of water. And, and don't be mad because I, I didn't do metric and I didn't weigh it. <laughs> anyway, a week later, I, I strained the peppers uh, and blended them up in a blender and added just enough of the brine back in to uh, get the consistency that I was after. And that stuff is awesome. Uh, I've got another batch going on right now with my own homegrown habaneros and some hatch peppers that I uh, got at the grocery store, and I'm really looking forward to uh, seeing how that comes out. Uh, Sandor and I uh, uh, talked about mold or yeast sometimes forming on the surface of uh, veggie fermentations, uh, and I got an email from Troy in uh, Ripon, California, or is it Ripon, California? Uh, sorry, Troy. Uh, <laughs> Troy says, I've been fermenting veggies for years, and I've tried a few different techniques to prevent mold from growing on the top of vegetables, but sometimes it would still appear. That is, until I used my anaerobic sour beer-making experience. Troy says, after the veggies, water, and spices are loaded and ready to ferment, I purge my one-gallon jar through the airlock grommet with the lid slightly loose then quickly tighten it and put on the airlock. Uh, I've never had mold again, even without the vegetables being fully submerged in the brine. So there you go. Thanks, Troy. Purge your veggies with CO2 and keep that mold away. Uh, hey, uh, did you know our friends and sponsors Desiree and Dave over at High Gravity in Tulsa sell stuff for fermenting food, too? Uh, not that beer isn't food, beer and wine, but uh, they've got cheese-making equipment, cultures, Mother of Vinegar, kombucha starters, and they've got cool one-gallon and half-gallon glass jars with airlocks in the lid, uh, just like Troy's, and nifty ceramic weights uh, that will help keep your vegetables submerged under the brine. You never know what you'll find at HighGravityBrew.com. Beer and wine ingredient kits. Uh, if you want to put together your own recipes, the Build Your Own Beer page at HighGravityBrew.com is amazing. On one single page, they've got the contents of an entire fully stocked homebrew shop, from grain to hops to adjuncts to yeast. It's all there at HighGravityBrew.com. And, of course, if you want to enter the excellent world of electric brewing or upgrade your current electric setup, 
HighGravityBrew.com has a full line of Warthog controllers and systems, as well as other manufacturers, too. I have a Warthog single-vessel system, brew in a bag, uh, but you can also do two or three vessels from five gallons to two barrels. HighGravityBrew.com uh, will take the pain out of propane, and if you use the code EBC75BB, you can save 75 bucks off your electric gear purchase. That's at family-owned and operated HighGravityBrew.com. Well, a couple of shows ago, I talked to Chris Colby about CO2, uh, and Chris said his standard practice in replacing room air uh, with CO2 in the headspace of a keg was to purge it three times. Uh, well, I got a comment from Adam Ross, head brewer at uh, Twin Span Brewing, whom you heard on this show, uh, defending brown ales a while back. Uh, Adam says uh, there is allegedly a research paper from uh, Wien Steffen that confirms Chris's theory that purging and venting a keg three times will removed, uh, remove pretty much all the O2 in the tank. It's something like purging once gets rid of 75% of the oxygen, twice gets you 98%, and three times gets you to 999 Adam says, at twin span, I fill my brights with CO2 up to 5 PSI and then vent. I do that twice because I don't always have a place to send the CO2 that won't set off the CO2 monitors and require me to evacuate the brew house. <laughs> uh, Adam says, CO2 is expensive and I'm selling small batches quickly in-house. Uh, he says, uh, this paper allegedly exists because it's referenced all over the place online, but I've yet to actually find it. Thanks, Adam. Good to hear from you. Uh, if you're once, twice, three times a purger, uh, then apparently you're doing pretty good, it seems. Uh, by the way, Chris Colby will be uh, back next week uh, to talk about his new Hard Seltzer book, which is coming out very soon. Let's talk about our friends and sponsors at Tavor. If you listen to this show, you know about Tavor. It's a way to select delicious craft beers uh, you may not be able to find in your area and have them delivered to you. It's not a beer of the month club where someone chooses beer for you. You only pay for the beer that you choose over the course of the month. Signing up for Tavor is free. Just create an account at Tavor.com. That's T-A-V as in Victor, O-U-R.com, and download their iPhone or Android app. You'll uh, receive notifications for two new beers each day that are available for purchase with in-depth tasting notes from Philip at Tavor. This month, uh, Megan at Tavor says look for selections from Humble Abode, Lumberbeard, Full Circle, and Full City. If you're not interested in the beers you see, no worries. Just skip the ones you don't want. However, when you see something you do want, and you will, don't wait. Just click on it and add it to your crate. Your beer arrives fresh every few weeks, allowing enough time to fill a box and pay the least shipping. Why don't you check it out? It doesn't cost anything to sign up, and there's no obligation to purchase anything. In fact, if I can ask you a favor, go to Tavor.com, T-A-V as in Victor, O-U-R.com, or download the app, and when you sign up, enter the promo code BASICBREWING, all one word, uh, and you'll get 10 bucks off your first shipment of $25 or more. Again, it's free to sign up, and there is no obligation to purchase. Sign up at Tavor.com or with the Tavor app and use Basic Brewing as the promo code. Okay, as home brewers, we often want to be as hands-on as we can with our ingredients. Uh, we, we grow our own hops, for example. A lot of us do. So I was very excited to hear about Caleb Hutcherson and being able to get great quality honey just a couple of minutes from my house. So I asked Caleb if he'd talk to me about what it takes to raise our own bees. Caleb Hutcherson, welcome to Basic Brewing Radio. Thank you for having me. Where are we at? So we're in we're located in Prairie Grove at Pick and Peck Farms. Uh, this is my family little farm. It's a hobby farm. And we, um, as you can hear probably around me, I've got bees all around us. <laughs> Um, I've got 35 hives here, and I've got about 15 in Farmington. Um, so I've got two locations set up, and um, by next spring I'll have over 200 nukes available to sell um, at, at the Farmington location. And I'll probably have a few here also just for uh, when people pick up. Um, but we also have 90 hens, laying hens. Uh, so we get probably around 45 to 50 eggs a day. <laughs> so we've got we've got plenty of eggs. Um, we have okra and fresh produce that we sell at the farmers market. Um, I really got into beekeeping uh, when my mom uh, came home one day and she said, 
I've, I've got signed up to do some beekeeping and I would really like for you to um, learn how to do it because I'm pretty uncomfortable. I don't want to be around the bees. Um, <laughs> so I was like, well, I don't want to be around the bees either. Um, Thanks, Bob. Yeah, so um, I I quickly got attached to them when, when I started doing more research and figuring out um, kind of their behaviors and um, what they do for us. They pollinate one-third of our food, um, so it's it's very important to have them. Um, so I got into um, beekeeping right off the bat, and I, I had one hive, and then uh, it quickly grew to seven, and then I had about 15, and then uh, this year I got really into it, and I, as soon as COVID hit, I got out of school, and I wanted to find something I enjoyed doing um, for work-wise. Um, I do work for my parents. They do sell real estate at Lindsay. Um, but I wanted to find something I enjoyed, so um, I got connected with somebody at the Bee Alliance. His name's Jim Pickett. He uh, he did all the cutouts and swarm catches around Northwest Arkansas for years. Um, he quit doing it, um, and I just got to talking to him, and he said, well, I get um, so many calls a week, and I'll give them all to you. So when they call me, I'll call, or I'll have them call you. Well, it worked out great, and I wanted up getting like 20 calls a week, so... <laughs> Um, I was really busy. Um, I found a partner um, that had been beekeeping for about 16 years, so he had lots of experience. Um, he was just getting back into it. Um, he moved from uh, Oklahoma, and now he's in uh, Colorado. So I, I lost my partner, um, so now I'm going solo. Um, but we knocked out probably, I'd say, over, over 35 together this spring, um, cutouts or swarm catches and... Um, all the money that we did receive doing cutouts, we uh, we used it as a donation to our apiaries, huh. and we were able to um, buy boxes, um, the equipment to house the bees. Um, so I haven't paid hardly anything for what I have, and that was kind of my goal going into next spring: is um, I can get all these free bees, and I can um, split them into different hives and uh, sell them. For new beekeepers uh, to get started, um, so that was my main my main goal going into this. You said uh, use the word nukes yes. earlier. What's a nuke? So a nuke is a five frame hive um, that is not mature enough to go into a ten frame just yet. So when, um, for instance, if I if I caught a swarm off a tree, um, I would shake them into a nuke box uh, with frames in it, five frames and I would feed them sugar water and they would um, they would grow that hive into um, a nucleus and that would be um, the main part of a ten frame once it got started so what I could do is, is I could go and take that five frame and I could go put it in a ten frame and they could grow it out and once they got um, three more frames full I would be able to put another brood box on top or a super if I chose to um, use a single chamber brood box. So so if listeners can can picture you you've seen the the typical white usually white yes boxes uh-huh. so the so like the bottom part is is basically their home yes and then the the upper parts are sort of warehouses is so, that the way it works So typically um, they can, the queen can lay in a super box um, a honey well pretty much a honey box is what you want to call it um, for listeners that don't know beekeeping um, where they store their honey but the brood box is primarily where the queen will lay her eggs and you can lay a queen excluder where she cannot get up on top where Uh. the honey is so it makes it a lot easier for the beekeeper to to know where the queen is at all times she's going to be in that brood box but I do not use queen excluders Hmm. she can go up and move wherever she'd like Um, you know it is an extra expense to buy all those extra um, queen excluders when you have this many hives. Mm-hmm. Um, so typically, I'm very gentle. I'm, I'm able to get in and do my work and um, assess them and make sure they're healthy and not have to worry about the queen. So Now does that, if she, lay egg, if she lays eggs in the other parts of the boxes, does that, does that affect the quality of the honey or do you have to uh, No, it does not. So um, you, you can strain honey um, so many different ways. Um, 
you're going to be able to, so say a honey or a hive was honey bound and the queen had laid eggs up top where the honey was, um, you could go ahead and to put it in your extractor, spin it out, and you could go and put those uh, frames back in that hive so she has room to lay her eggs. Ah. Yeah. So you can you can strain the honey; it'd be fine if if she did lay her eggs in there. So, so you've got you've got now you you, uh, you said cutouts. Yes. Now what is it? What is a cutout? So a cutout is um, where someone has bees um, in a location that they are unwanted. Um, like their house. Yes. <laughs> their walls. Yes. Say their, say their walls of their house or their buildings, their shops. Um, I go in and I um, perform a cutout, which is where I go in and just cut out where the bees are located. I've got to find them. And I cut out that piece of uh, sheetrock in their wall of their house or um, the siding. I take off the siding and um, cut through their house. So that's pretty much it. It's, it's, it's pretty simple once you get the hang of it. Um, you can knock out, uh, I've knocked out four or five a day. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, it's just really fast paced and you can you can knock them out pretty quick once you get used to it. Wow. And a swarm is like somebody calls up and they've got a swarm on their fence post yes. or their plants or their trees Absolutely. or whatever. And it's like, what do I do? Yes. So definitely I always tell people if they see a swarm, contact a beekeeper. You don't have to contact me. But I do recommend call a beekeeper because they're going to be able to manage them. They're going to be able to um, save them and um, use 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 them for benefits. Right. Um, so right. yeah, it's it's always nice to have bees. So you you uh, you're collecting bees. You're getting free bees. Yep, free, <laughs> free bees. That's that's kind of my goal. Nobody says, "Hey, I want the bees uh, after you take them out of my house." And <laughs> mm-hmm. yep. Now you did a, a pretty dramatic extraction or cutout, uh, and it's on YouTube mm-hmm. of uh, Old Main. If you look at the University of Arkansas logo, Old Main is the the big main building on campus. Oh. And talk about the extraction that you that you did there. Yes, so it's a very historic building. It um, so a lot went into it. There was a lot of um, teams that had to approve everything that went on with that. Um, they had to to get a lift that went up seven stories high, um, <laughs> and that was about $1,000 a day. So um, the process was kind of lengthy, uh, but they had to hurry up and um, get the job done so they weren't sitting with a lift that cost $1,000 a day. So... They called me in, and I went over there and assessed the uh, the hive and found out where they were. And we went in full full bore and um, got them cut out, and we extracted over a hundred pounds of honey in that hive. <laughs> wow! It was it was absolutely amazing. And if you hadn't seen the video, it's it's worth watching because that honey you know, you don't ever see honeycomb like that. Uh-huh. Um, I've that that's the biggest honey extraction I've done this year, and it was awesome. Well, not only I mean, if you're if you're a little easily triggered, uh, you know, there's a warning there because not only are there bees flying all around. If you've got you know if you have a fear of bees, but if you have a fear of heights, you're on this extender thing yes. that it's not. Is it seven feet? It's not well, seven so, stories. Well, so so it goes. Um, it's capable of going yes, seven stories, ca- but yeah. you're but you're like four stories in there. Yep. we still. were we were up about sixty five to seventy feet. Well, okay, and, that's seven stories. <laughs> yeah, we had harnesses on. We were we were actually very comfortable. I I didn't have a problem being up there at oh, all. Oh man, I those, actually those enjoyed. Things, the, did it wiggle? It did. Uh, oh. Yeah, with three with three people up there, I had a cameraman. I had uh, which was my partner, Averin. Um, and then I had a um, University of Arkansas employee up there also. So if you moved, it would definitely sway a little bit. But it was pretty safe. I actually felt very comfortable. Um, I was able to do the job and get out of there. Well, that's amazing. Yes. Uh, so so uh, so you get the, you you get these uh, hives, or you get these swarms and the cutouts, and you put them in uh, your boxes. Yes. You know, you kind of tame them. Absolutely. What is the process like? I mean, how how is it to take 
care of bees? How much yep. work is it to, yeah, to take so care of them? There's a lot of uh, time uh, that goes into caring for bees, um, especially during cutout season. Um, what what I do is when I go to a cutout, I come prepared and I bring um, pretty much a hive body with me, and um, five or six empty frames, uh, just depending on how big I think the the hive is inside there and how long it's been there. Um, but I will cut out that comb and that brood that she has laid her eggs on, and I will put it in the frames. And I'll rub it, rubber band it, and I'll set it back into the brood box huh. with bees on it. And then I will drive home, and I will put, I will dump the rest of the bees in there that I've vacuumed off. And it's like they never even left their hive. Huh? Yeah. And you use a, use like a shop vac to. I do. Yes. So I have a um, I have a bee vac is what it's called, and it's got a um, cage in this seven gallon bucket that um, has a tube connected to it and I'm able to uh, vacuum them off. Huh. So. And, then, and then once they're settled, once they're in the, and I guess the first, how long does it take until they get established and start making honey um, after they're moved yes. into their new home? So um, after they're moved, I'd, I'm not really sure. It just depends on the time of the year um, and if there's a honey flow. Um, I typically do feed them once they get, get home. I'll I'll get a mason jar and I'll get an entrance feeder and I'll I'll feed them for a few days to With make sure, sure sugar that, water. Yeah, so that it makes sure that they're they're comfortable and um, they're not going to starve. Because I mean that's a lot of bees and when you take when you take their honey out of their hive, um, it, it can really stress them out and hmm. do do damage. So and that's their and then the, that's their nutrition. So yeah. so you got to keep that in mind. Absolutely. And they're changing locations too, so um, they haven't really figured this area out yet. Um, they don't know anything about it, so once you you put them in that box, then they've got to figure it out. Uh, but they, their survival is very, very neat to watch. I mean, they thrive in this location. Hmm. Uh, we have the lake up here. We've got so many uh, gardens and flower gardens and everything. So Yeah, yeah. So that we there's there's a lot of talk about uh, you know the bees uh, being in trouble and and the bee populations being down, yes. but it sounds like Northwest Arkansas is doing pretty good. Yeah, Northwest Arkansas is booming with bees right now. It's it's crazy, and there's not a lot of people that do what I do, um, mm. which I'm I'm okay with. Uh, <laughs> it gives me more business, and um, but it's it's doing great here in Northwest Arkansas. Um, Colony collapse disorder it has um, played effect in um, a lot of beekeepers' hives, and um, that's one thing I I definitely look for. Um, I don't want that to happen here. Mm -hmm. um, I haven't had that happen here, thankfully. Um, I have had a few swarm on me, um, but that's just life. You know, bees bees are going to swarm. Um, so that's I I've only had about two or three swarm on me this year. Um, now, but, what's that mean when, when a hive swarms? So, um, when you keep them in a, when I keep them in a nuke too long, um, they run out of room for her to lay, and uh, so they, they need to swarm somewhere else. And typically, they swarm on our okra, they swarm on our tomato plants, so <laughs> I'm able to get them back into a, um, a new box. So, pretty much, I, I get to split them in a different way from changing frames to another box. So that's another thing that that uh, beekeepers have to look out for is they got to make sure that they have plenty of space. Exactly. And yeah. As long as they have plenty of space and plenty of food and all that, do mm -hmm. they pretty much stay in place, or is there yeah. a periodic time that that swarms just happen? Yeah. So um, swarm season is um, from March all the way up to. I mean, I caught a swarm yesterday. Mm. So um, it can go into late September. Wow. Yeah. So it it goes for a good a good period of time, and I mean I get calls for cutouts um, even late November. So huh. yeah, and and I guess do you have to handle the bees differently if it's cold outside? You know, if it's past the season when you're moving them, or they, is is it more yeah, risk? Yeah, I definitely rec I definitely recommend um, to the people that have them in in their homes at that that time that um, if these aren't bothering you, I definitely recommend 
me coming back when it's warmer mm. um, because when it's cold outside you they can't they can't survive that long they've got to keep their temperature of their hive um, balanced and they do a great job of that they fan their wings and keep it the temperature they need um, to, sur to, to survive in, in the cold weather burn that sugar yeah they do yeah <laughs> so well they um, they eat their honey for energy and that gives them um, enough energy to fan their wings and keep that temperature going. Now you're, you're talking to uh, uh, mostly home brewers all around the world, uh, you know, and hobbyists. And so, you know, we, we like to get into different things. Uh, so if you're thinking about getting into, into uh, beekeeping, what are some, what are some things that you got to think about? Yeah. What is, what's the equipment that you need okay. to get into? What's the best sources of information? Yeah, so um, definitely when you want to think about starting beekeeping, um, you've, you've got to make sure you have room um, for them. You can't just like have a small backyard and uh, throw a couple beehives back there. Um, first off, you've got to check your POA and make sure that you've got um, the rules of your neighborhood um, situated and make sure that you've got... Um, the experience, so you've got to you've got to do your homework on these uh, these bees. You've got to know um, what to look for. You've got to know what a queen is. You've got to know what a drone is. You've got to know what a worker bee is, and um, you've got to know how to find eggs. So you've got to do your homework before you um, decide to get bees. And then once you do your homework, go to um, an online store or your local beekeeping shop and um, talk to them, interact with them, and find out how you can um, get started in a group. There are all, there's always beekeeping groups around your areas. Um, find a beekeeper, find a mentor um, that can come and help you set up the bees once, once you have your boxes in place. Um, and that's exactly what I did. Um, Earl Rowe, he uh, lives probably a mile from me, and he, uh, he's a master beekeeper. He got me set up right here in this backyard and um, we were able to put the nuke of bees that I had just gotten into a 10 frame hive and um, I started feeding them immediately and they grew and grew and grew and then I put um, was able to put three supers on top and mm -hmm. harvest two supers of honey my first year Wow! so um, honey production is very good um, but when you when you start beekeeping, you definitely need to know the information first. You don't want to just dive in and um, try and learn as you go, um, because you're going to fail and you're going to waste your money. Mm -hmm. Because bees are expensive. Um, the prices of bees are going up mm -hmm. big time. Um, back in 2011, I looked, and um, from 2006 to 2011, um, a nuke of bees was about 180 to 100 dollars. And now they're up to one hundred and eighty dollars. Wow! Yes. Wow! And the boxes to to house them in is anywhere from two hundred and fifteen dollars to three hundred fifty. Oh wow! Yeah. So it gets very expensive. Um, if you you're a carpenter and you know how to to build your own boxes, then I definitely recommend that. It's a lot cheaper way to go. Um, but what I do is when I when I perform a cutout and get these free bees. Um, I do accept a donation of a minimum of $250 so I can house these bees. Mm. And I go over to um, Sam at Hive Right in Prairie Grove, and he has his own, um, his, he has his own bee work business. Huh. So he has all the equipment for me, and I call him, and he has it ready for me to pick up, and I'm able to come home and put him up and, uh, be done with it so I don't have to worry about that so it's it's very nice it's everything's easy once you know how to do it right yeah yeah <laughs> once you figure it out it it's step by step so so you use the term super so there are different sizes yes. of boxes that you put on top of the of the, the the main so talk about how much honey can you expect to get out of each of these um well it varies um just depending on how the weather is um in the, in the spring and going into the summer, um, you can have anywhere from, uh, let's say, you can take roughly 12 gallons off a hive 
or you can, or if it's a first year hive, I don't recommend taking much. Um, if you do, um, it just it it gives them more more food and uh, more energy going into the winter, mm. and they can survive the winter. And once they get, survive through the winter, it's it's easy from there. You're you're able to stack them boxes up. I mean, just <laughs> stack them up. I mean, six six or seven wow. high. Wow. Um, so you're you're going to be able to get more honey out of your next year if you just leave them alone. And with my young hives, I don't take anything off of them. I've got probably 15 hives that I take off, take honey off of, and I leave it at that. I I don't try and take them off my first year hives if I if I can. So you said you said 12. 10 to 12 gallons, is that right? 10 to 12 gallons. And each, I weighed, uh, I bought a, a quart of, of honey off you uh, the other day to make a mead with, mm -hmm. and I weighed that, and eat, and the quart was like three pounds. Yep, through about three pounds. So three, pound, three pounds times four times 10, that's, <laughs> that's how many pounds of honey. Mm -hmm. That's a lot of honey. Yeah. Um, so once you, once you collect the honey, how do you collect the honey, and what kind of equipment do you need there? Yeah, so um, to collect the honey, you'll need... Um, some type of scraper to cut out the wax cappings um, once you remove this, the supers or the deep frames that have honey in them. Um, you'll need an extractor um, in which you can go to your beekeeping group and ask to borrow one. Um, typically they'll say yes, you need to call this person, they have it, you can pick it up uh, for free. Um, or you can buy your own. Now, is that extractor? Is that kind of like a centrifuge kind of a thing? Where yeah. You spin, so spin uh, the honey out? I have a two-frame extractor. Um, I haven't upgraded my extractor yet. I <laughs> I'm kind of tight, so I like to save my money for um, rainy days because you never know. Um, Smart. Yeah, but I use a two-frame extractor. You don't need anything really more than that. I mean, I have over 50 hives, and I have a two-frame extractor, so it's a longer time to extract, um, but then again, you're not spending $1,500 on a big extractor. Uh, eventually, yes, I will need a bigger extractor, um, but that's that's next year. Um, mm. But anyway, you'll need um, you'll need an extractor. You'll need a scraping tool. You'll need a food grade bucket to let the honey strain into, um, and some type of sieve or um, some kind of filtering yes, device. Yes, you'll need. Um, you can even use panios if you like, um, <laughs> or cheesecloth. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I use cheesecloth a lot um, when I do my cutouts. Um, that comb goes into cheesecloth, and I squeeze it out into a bowl, and it um, it does pretty well. Huh? When I was a kid, we used to get the honey jars with the honeycomb in it. Uh, we used yeah. to eat the honeycomb. Mm -hmm. but yep, I do sell um, honeycomb um, at the first of the year. Um, and then I let them have it and draw out that honeycomb uh, for next year. Huh. Yeah. So at the beginning of the year, I have probably around, um, well, this year I had around probably 100 jars with honeycomb in it. And um, I've gotten a lot of attention off that, and a lot of people want it. But I sold out really quick. Uh. Um, but I've just got to give them time to to draw out that comb again yeah. and fill it up with honey. So it's a process. Mm -hmm. um, and you have to have specific frames for that. You just can't have plastic foundation frames to get honeycomb out of. Um, you have to let them draw it out on a single frame. And you can, um, you can get a wax starter for them, um, or you can get fishing line and run it through the frames, and they can draw it down, and then you can cut it out into um, little honeycombs and drop it into the, the pint jars or quart jars. Huh. Yeah, just depending on what size you, you prefer. And h how many times do you harvest uh, a hive yeah. every year? Uh, so it's either once or twice, once or twice a year per hive. Um, some are different, some are stronger, um, and produce a lot more honey. Um, it just depends on the size of your hive and the population of bees. So um, the most I've extracted from a hive this year is three times. Wow! So yeah, you can you can extract pretty good amounts of honey. And once once it gets cold, you you get the season off, or is there yeah, still maintenance so, that has um, to happen? Yeah. So the first of September, I don't extract 
Um, again, I let them have it, um, and I leave them plenty of honey. Um, I don't, I don't necessarily need a lot of honey uh, from my first year hives, uh, but I expect a little bit more out of my my older hives that I've had for three years. So yeah, um, they do a great job. I mean, if you just let them go the first year without taking much honey, I mean, you can take a frame or two. That's not going to hurt them, mm -hmm. but. Um, just for personal use and not to sell yet and if you do that then you're going to have so much honey you're not going to know what to do with it <laughs> you're going to be giving it for christmas presents um, <laughs> you're going to be selling it yeah, to your co-workers so it's it's a fun time um, harvesting honey and uh you uh the You've got mostly wildflowers out here. Uh -huh. you, you know, you've got some uh, vegetable garden here. So uh, the honey um, that I, I tasted it, and I, I thought it was fairly fairly neutral. You know, kind of a wildflower honey. Mm -hmm. I'm not a big expert on honey flavors, but um, you know, definitely different honeys taste different yeah. depending on where they yeah. are. Um, but I I thought. And it may have been that I'd bought some peppers off y'all too. Mm -hmm. I thought there was a little bit of a of a peppery, like a you know bell peppery note in there too. But I I let my wife taste it and she didn't taste that. So I mean, <laughs> could be power suggestion. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, um, definitely. The um, honey that I harvested the first of the year is uh, clover honey. Um, it was a lighter um, golden color, huh. which, which I like. Um, I do, I do really, really like the darker honey though. Hmm. Um, towards the um, end of summer, and um, after spring, and that's that's more wildflower honey. And you can even um, put clover honey and wildflower honey together and mix them, hmm. and which is really good. So, and that's what I, I had just given you a minute ago. Oh, nice. About, yeah. Nice. So I hope you enjoy that. Yeah. I feel another mead to come Yeah, on. you can you can even put in your tea too if you like. <laughs> um, and uh, yeah, we have to get you hooked up with Steve Wilkes at the homebrew shops. Get you get you making some mead as well. Yeah, I would love to learn that. Um, <laughs> that's definitely been um, on the bucket list. So I'd like that. The 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 plastic food grade bucket list. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, I would love I would love to uh, learn how to make some mead for sure. Yeah, we'll we'll, we'll fix you up. Okay. Well, this has been fun. Any other words of sage words of advice uh, before we uh, shut her down? Yeah, definitely. Um, when you see a swarm, call a beekeeper, um, and even ask um, a beekeeper for help if you're getting into uh, beekeeping. Uh, beekeepers love to help others. Um, you know, you're helping the bees, and people love to help the bees. So, um, just ask somebody for help if you need it. Um, don't feel ashamed if you've got to ask somebody for help because mm. that's what happens a lot is they just don't want to ask people for help and um, typically if the bees are having a problem you can you can find the solution um, you know bees take care of themselves primarily uh, but they definitely need a beekeeper um, so if you see a swarm call them they're going to help you um, and if you want to get into beekeeping you can get a hold of me and I'd love to even help you so awesome yeah you may be getting some emails. <laughs> oh, and, and where can people find you on Facebook and Yeah, Instagram so I have a Facebook page. It's uh, Caleb's Bees, um, C's Bees for short. And um, on Instagram, I have C's Bees as well. So you can find me on there. And um, I'm located in Prairie Grove, Arkansas at 11013 Bob Kid Lake Road. And I'm, I'm pretty much always here. And if I'm not here, I'm either catching a swarm or... <laughs> I've gone hunting or fishing, so. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Awesome. Thanks, Caleb. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you for having me. Well, thanks again to Caleb. I shot video of Caleb opening up some hives and showing off uh, the honey for an upcoming video episode. And neither one of us got stung, <laughs> even though the bees were very active. Uh, pretty amazing. Uh, if you go to YouTube and search for Old Main Bees... You can see that video of Caleb uh, removing that enormous hive uh, at the University of Arkansas way up in the air. Uh, if you have brewing questions, show suggestions, or just want to say howdy, write to james at basicbrewing.com or just fill out the contact form on basicbrewing.com. And please don't forget to tell us where you're from. Check out our mobile-friendly shop at basicbrewingshop.com. 
Thanks, everybody, supporting us through our Patreon page. Special goodies coming your way. Check that out at patreon.com slash basicbrewing. It's all until next time. Until then, thanks for listening, everybody. I'm James Spencer. Production help for Basic Brewing Radio and our website is provided by Kelly Donson. Basic Brewing Radio is a production of Active Voicing. Talk to you next time, everybody. In the meantime, stay well and stay tuned. So long.